What's it like being a Rothschild? Well, of course, I'm the wrong person to ask because I was born a Rothschild and I'm still a Rothschild, so I didn't know what it's like to be anyone else. So, um, I think you, you become aware the name has a kind of pulling power and the name sometimes gets, you know, gets a second take. And when, when I was younger, I found that very off-putting because I didn't feel that I lived up to this extraordinary reputation. I didn't live up to the magnificence. I didn't feel I was particularly good at anything. So I think it took me to get older and to establish my own career then to, to see it actually as quite an honor, really, to be part of this extraordinary tradition. The story really begins in Frankfurt, in the Jewish ghetto in the city, and the name Rothschild comes from the name of the house of their ancestors, which was the house of the Red Shield. So the dynasty was really established by Meyer Amschel Rothschild, who was born in 1743 or 1744, and he set up home in Frankfurt. And he married a member of, um, an, of another Jewish family called Gutler Schnapper, and between them they had 19 children, of which 10 survived, five girls and five boys. So the Judengasse um, was in Frankfurt, and it was built to house originally, I think it was something like 60 Jewish families, and within a matter of decades, there were you know, there were several hundred families. There were thousands of people living in a street that was a few yards wide, and I think it was about a hundred yards long. The houses were so densely packed together that light hardly got in there. And now my family, the Rothschilds, um, lived in a house that was 14 feet wide. So you can imagine it was a very cramped uh, environment. And you can also imagine what the impetus was to get out of there. It's very hard to imagine the extent of the restrictions. They had to spend every night in the ghetto. They had to wear clothing, which identified them as Jews. And the parks had outside them a notice saying, no pigs, no Jews. So it was an incredibly restrictive society, and therefore astonishing that Mar Amschel Rothschild was able to do what he did. Jews were allowed to deal in coins, and coins were a big thing at that time because you had so many small states in Germany and elsewhere that they were collected. And somehow, Mar Amschel Rothschild. By the middle of the 19th century, the Rothschilds had become established members of British society. They were involved in finance and politics. And Nathan's son Lionel, in 1847, was elected as MP for the City of London. But he wasn't, as a practising Jew, allowed to take his seat in Parliament for another 11 years until 1858, when an act was passed removing the bar to Jews taking the oath of allegiance. Lionel's son, Natty, was also very involved in politics. He gave advice to the government on financial matters. And in 1885, he was made the first 
Lord Rothschild, the first Baron Rothschild of Tring. And in doing so, he became the first Jewish peer to take a seat in the House of Lords, following in his father's footsteps, I guess, within the political arena. There's, a, there's a, an assumption that most Rothschilds are bankers, because of course that's what you know, we were known for, and of course that's how our fortune was made. But over the centuries, we've diversified. And The famous ones are probably wine, and of course the ownership of the two great Bordeaux vineyards, Chateau Mouton Rothschild and Chateau Lafitte Rothschild, which are still in family ownership, which were acquired in the 19th century. And then there's racing. A lot of members of the family were very keen on the turf and raced horses very successfully. There are quite a lot of classic winners. Um, and of course, the art collections, which are possibly the most famous aspect of all. And Wadston is a very good example of that with extraordinary collections of 18th century furniture and paintings, very much in what's called the Rothschild style. The original founding father, N.M. Rothschild, said that Rothschild women could only be employed as archivists or bookkeepers. So that rather narrowed down a, a woman's role in the family. So they had to find other ways. And one of the ways that they managed was actually to be custodians of the collection and custodians really of the family's honour, if you like. So if you take this house, Wadston Manor, and you think about its history, Ferdinand built it, and the collection was brought together from very you know, different, disparate parts of the family. But it was his sister Alice who actually made sure that the collection stayed together. And Alice was an extraordinary woman. She uh, was the person who introduced the very exacting standards. So the collection had to be put to bed over the winter. You could only touch something if you were wearing gloves. And the gardeners lived in terror of her because she would go down to the borders and tell you, you know, that was slightly, that needs deadheading or that's the wrong colour pink or something. And she added actually to the collection in her own way. Another great heroine here is, is Dolly or Mrs. James to Rothschild, who I knew when I was a child. And they used to kind of call up, you know, Mrs. James is coming. And she would arrive with a pug dog under her arm and, and, and she would walk around the house and there wasn't a detail that she didn't miss. And actually, it's those standards which those two women instilled in the house, which are still carried out on a day-to-day -day basis. And it's those standards, I think, which maintain the standard of excellence that we're so proud of here. There was the transition period from it being a private house to becoming part of the National Trust with a very strong family influence, both in terms of works of art in the house and the property outside. When my late cousin, who left me responsibility for carrying on her work, carried out that transfer, that change, we opened the public and we had 12,000 visitors. Today we have 450,000. We've also added significantly to the collection here. We've made acquisitions which complement it, like, for example, the painting by Chardin. We do exhibitions which are both thoughtful and academic, and at the same time which have a popular appeal. There's a deep involvement here from our family, both um, from my daughter Hannah, and from myself, and from other members. I think with privilege comes responsibility, and if you're lucky enough, which I am and have been, to have been born into a family where you know, there is so much opportunity, and, and the, you're surrounded by so many beautiful things, that the opportunity to share that beyond yourself and the opportunity to explain the stories and put it into a wider context, I think, you know, is something which I'm actually genuinely very excited by. Mm -hmm.